It's been a busy few days for this year's Spring Watch stars. In the weekend sun, the action really hotted up. We've had some dramatic departures. Some amazing new arrivals. And down in the reed beds, there are mixed fortunes for our sticklebacks, Phil and Cy. Welcome to week three of Spring Watch. Yes, hello and welcome to Spring Watch 2015. It's our third week coming to you live from the beautiful RSPB Minsmere Reserve here on the coast of Suffolk. And look at it tonight, basking in this early evening light. It's a very special place, great range of habitats, sculpted over years by the RSPB, which are home to more than 5,000 different species. It's a beautiful place to be and a beautiful place to see some fantastic wildlife. Britain's largest mammal, largest terrestrial mammal anyway, lives here in the form of red deer. Lots of rabbits. Now they're a non-native but they do a great job of keeping the heath short here which means it's a nice hot place for lots of insects. And of course lots of birds that feed on those insects. Green woodpeckers and little owls included. Down on the scrape it's always a hubbub of activity with the black-headed gulls and lots of wading birds. Now our mission is to bring you the very best of British wildlife and to do that we've got lots of cameras wired out across the reserve and one of these we've been looking at for the last couple of weeks and to be honest with you not much has happened. This little wading bird has sat down in a bower of its own making pulling the grass over the top of its head incubating its eggs. But let's go live to the red shank now. There she is, still covered by that grass, but if we pull out, you can see there on the lower right-hand side of your screen an empty egg shell. Yes, there's been some hatching, <laughs> and we'll have a bit more of that later on. All very exciting. Let's have a look at another live camera, and it's one that's become a favourite for many of you. It is the nest of spineless Cy, the little stickleback. Who's and there? there he Who's is. There? And, and he's fanning. He's fanning away. He's got to fan those eggs. I mean, for those of you that have just joined us this week, he's got this little nest down there under the silt. It's very difficult to see, but he's got eggs in there, and he's fanning them to oxygenate them until they hatch out into baby little sticklebacks. But he's had quite an eventful weekend, both him and his rival Frisky Phil, and we'll be bringing you news of that later. And it's been actually quite a dramatic weekend for our bearded tits as well, so we'll catch up with them. It has. Let's go to our long-tailed tits live. See what's going on. This beautiful nest there. You can just see inside. I don't know whether that's a bird or the feathers that they use to line the inside of the nest. But let's have a look at what's been going on. Now these chicks are growing very fast. The parents have been very solicitous. And in fact that nest is starting to literally bulge. But because it's got spider's web inside it can stretch. But those chicks are going to go fairly soon. They've opened up the front of that nest, but what a beautiful thing it is. With all that lichen woven into the structure. Isn't it gorgeous? But the bird is so beautiful as well. I it mean, is, I could watch yeah. that bird for ages. It's absolutely lovely thing, gorgeous. Yeah. Now, on the Thursday night show, we left you with our shoveler chicks. Just, they just hatched, and we, we only managed to see a tiny little inkling of them. But after that, we saw an awful lot more. Take a look. Now, this is the nest. And you can see the little chicks there. And these chicks are an example of precocial young. But they hatch and then within a couple of hours, they start leaving the nest, becoming independent and feeding. And you can see this one, it's pecking away. It has a real instinct to peck. And then Friday morning, the mother leads them off. We thought there were only seven eggs, but you can see there, it's quite a brood, isn't it? Nine little chicks. And it's very important that they are let off because obviously ground nesting birds, they're very vulnerable to predators. So the mother leads them away, which is good strategy unless a predator finds them, then they don't really stand much of a chance because they can't fly away. But she'll take them to water at this stage. She's on a beeline for the nearest body of water because they're much safer out on the water than they are in that grass, particularly down there on the scrape. No large things like pike that might take them. I guess you've got otters. They yeah. would take them given a chance, but on the water, they're going to be safer. But I guess, 
the fact is they have nine because they yep. might not all survive. Of course, yeah, yeah. That's the sort of tadpole strategy, if you like. Just make a lovely little hors d'oeuvre, though, wouldn't they, mate? Oh, stop Cocktail steak. <laughs> sorry, are we live? Oh, sorry. <laughs> Now, there are two distinctly different strategies that the birds here at Minsmere are employing. As Michaela says, those ducks are precocial, so they come out of the egg and within hours they're out of the nest and they're ready to peck and so on. But there's a completely different strategy where the chicks, when they hatch out, they're just little pink blobs. And that is like our blue tits, and they're ultracial. That's a fancy word. Now you can see, there they are. They're going to be in that nest for nearly three weeks and they're totally dependent on the parents. You know, they couldn't possibly leave until they've grown up, done a lot of growing up. Now, I know that an awful lot of you were waiting for those blue tits to fledge. We had a little, we'd opened a book, hadn't we? <laughs> we were all completely wrong. We were just wrong. miles, we all put a quid in, didn't we? Yeah. I don't know who won, but we didn't. Well, I betted Friday morning, which was wrong. I, was I went Friday morning too. Afternoon, morning. Was wrong. But they did go, of course, in the end. And yesterday morning, early, just before nine o'clock, things began in the nest box. They burst out. Now to begin with, just imagine, they've been in there safe in that nest box and now they're into the big wide world. The first few left fairly rapidly. There they are, popping out. The parents standing back, letting their chicks come out. This fall sat there for a while, but then two more popped out. One of them not terribly well. Down nope. it went. <laughs> and the last two went up into the roof. And they actually stayed up in the roof for a while. And the adult had to come in and try and coax them out with a juicy looking slug or something, a little morsel. But then eventually, even those ones up in the roof dropped down and they too, that one left. And the last one, here it comes, all safely out. And as soon as we knew that they were out, we rushed down, cameraman went down to try and find them, and here they are, still being looked after by the adults. And the adults will look after them for the next few days, still feeding them. Do you know, Martin, I was out on the reserve on Sunday, and an hour after they fledged, I saw lots of blue tits in a tree nearby. I don't know if it was our blue tits, but there were loads of people enjoying watching them because they were so sweet on the tree. Cheeping away, aren't they? Yeah, like that. they're really lovely. Well, I guess that's it's happening delightful. all over the country now. Yeah. Well, two it, went in my garden at the weekend. Did they? Yeah. Two nest lots and a lot of wrens as well. It seemed to be the weekend for them to go. Well, that's good, but the BTO have told, British Trust for Ornithology, have said it's not been a very good year for blue tits generally. The harsh spring, it suddenly had that cold snap, and they have not done that well. So our birds have done well. And that's partially because the parents were so solicitous and looked after them, particularly the mother. She's an interesting character. When we first saw her, we were very worried about her because she looked really scruffy. We thought she had feather mites, little parasites living on her. And then, look at that, she's got a ring on. We were able to identify who she was. The Waveney ringing group told us that she was either a three-year-old female or, more likely, a six-year-old bird. Now, that's very surprising. I mean, it's difficult to, it's sort of almost meaningless to, to say how, uh, what's the average lifespan of these, of a blue tit, say, because they, they tend to die very quickly, sadly. But the, if they do survive the first year, they probably live for about three years. So for her to be six mm. and still mm. producing young. Ten young. Ten young. She could be even older than six, because that, you know, she, she could have been rung. She wasn't rung as a chick. So yeah. seven. Who knows? A record-breaking female. Great success. It might compel you to compose a reverdy. Oh. A reverdy. Today's spring word, reverdy. It's a poem that's composed at the joy of the arrival of spring, or oh. spring success, like fledging like that. Oh, you're like good that. with your Well, poems. that's going to be really easy to get in the show, yeah. then, isn't a it? Reverdy. Isn't it? A reverdy. Oh, a challenge. <laughs> if you were watching last week, you'll know that we had one of our cameras on another type of bird, a predatory bird that comes out at night. It's an owl, of course. On the other side of the reserve, in an old oak tree, we had located a barn owl's nest. It had three young in the nest and we were treated to lots of views of the adults hunting, both in the daytime, late in the afternoon, and of course at night. Here are those three youngsters. And as is typical in these birds, because of the way they incubate the eggs, you end up with a range of different sizes. So you've got one big one, one middle sized one, and there was one smaller bird. You can see it there on the left hand side of your frame whilst its larger sibling scoffs down that vault. Well, we were wondering about how the little guy would fare, 
Everything was going well, to be quite honest with you, last week, but then the weather forecast wasn't particularly good Friday. Lots of heavy rain. Barn owls don't like that. Let's see what happened over the course of the weekend. Weather does have an impact on these species. What we noticed was that the younger birds seemed to be getting weaker and weaker. Here you can see it in the foreground. Now there are only three in the nest, and this hints at something unusual. Barn owl broods are normally between five and six, but this year the recorders tell us they're down to between four and five in the nest. So could it be a shortage of food? Because in the end, that chick died. So we're down to two chicks in the nest now. It might have been a shortage of food, it might have been something else. Difficult to postulate, really. And it's a shame, because as you were saying on Thursday, we were discussing, you and I, weren't we, about whether yeah. it would survive, and we thought and he, it would. And, and it was looking good, it was looking strong. But, I mean, the thing is, they need about, I don't know, 100 grams of food a day, that's four voles. Mm. The question is, how many voles are they getting when the weather's bad? And if the larger chicks are scoffing them all, then unfortunately the smallest one loses out. That's part of the strategy. Well, I must say, we were quite worried about the two remaining chicks because over the last few days, they haven't been getting four or five prey items. In fact, Saturday in the day, there was no sign of the adult. Saturday night, single parent, just five feeds. Sunday, we saw no feeds in the day, and then Sunday night, five feeds. So as I say, they haven't been getting as many feeds as they should have done. You could see the adult bird coming in there, and it, we are only seeing one bird come in and feeding those chicks. But look, you can see the chick coming out of the nest. Now, actually, it's looking a lot larger than it looks when it's in the nest. Yeah. So, I don't know, maybe it's not far off coming out. Well, imagine. you can see that, it, you know, the down is disappearing from the, the crown of its head there, and you can see sort of adult feathers through. And, of course, its wing feathers, its primary feathers, are quite well down. They'll soon be spending a lot more time out of that nest, trying to grab the food as soon as the adult brings it in. Well, let's have a look at them live now and see how they're getting on. They're both there in the nest. The the dead chick is still there. You can't see it, but it is still there. What do you think is going to happen to that, Chris? Well, you know, if it were very small, then typically the adult might feed it to the other chicks or take it away. But now it's quite large and it's not going to be too long, another week or so, maybe a little longer before they leave that nest. I think it's just going to remain there, actually. That could mm. make the nest pretty disgusting. Yeah, but they it? are spending more time out That's of the true. nest anyway. And it's quite mm. a large chamber. We'll, we'll have to see what happens. But, you know, the forecast isn't that great for tonight. It's going to be a very cold night. Hopefully it won't be windy and they'll get more feeds. But you can keep an eye on that overnight on our cameras that are live on the red button and online as well. Now, if I was to say to you, can you name some venomous British animals? What would you say? You might say adders, yeah, it could be a spider, but you probably wouldn't think of a tiny, furious little mammal. Hidden away amongst Hertfordshire's five motorways, just beyond Greater London is a lush oasis, Lemsford Springs. Fed by warm, clean water from an underground aquifer, conditions are perfect for aquatic plants. What was once a Victorian watercress bed is now a magnet for a remarkable number of small mammals. Eight species of mouse, vole, and shrew make Lemsford their home. Peter Oakenfull has spent the last 15 years trying to explore their secretive world. I work as an ecologist. My interest in small mammals because they're never seen really and they are almost at the start of the food chain. Every year, Peter conducts a rigorous survey to check how the small mammals are getting on. And the trapping is done with the long earth traps. It's over a three day period and by the third morning, that is generally when, when the numbers have peaked. The spring waters emerge at a constant 12 degrees centigrade. So Lemsford's shallow lagoon never freezes and the grasses on its banks flourish all the year round. One of the quietest small mammals that you can get, the field vole. It's almost tamer than a hamster. The unusual thing is that these are generally found in grassland habitat. It's obviously coming down just for you know, the rich pickings. We'll record the age, the sex, 
In this case, it's a male. The term would be scrotal. Peter's data is used to monitor Lemsford's mammal populations, and he's found an unusually high density of shrews. From the smallest, the pygmy shrew, to the most numerous, the common shrew, and perhaps the most spectacular, the water shrew. This is our largest shrew. It's Britain's only venomous mammal. The venom, it's in the saliva. Fortunately, the effect on humans is, is not hopefully long lasting. It's quite a ferocious animal for its size. It's probably just as well that it, it isn't the size of us because these would rule the planet. The toxin in its bite attacks the nervous system in its prey, causing convulsion, even paralysis, allowing the shrew to take down animals considerably larger than itself, such as frogs and rodents. In Lemsford, it devours scores of shrimps that thrive on the rotting watercress. Amazingly, it seems it can sniff them out underwater, blowing bubbles, then breathing in their scent. Furry feet and a keeled tail power it through the water. It's an insatiable predator, catching and consuming 80% of its body weight every day. Despite its name, the water shrew is only semi-aquatic. Its fur is far from waterproof, and drying off takes up a lot of its time. Solitary and secretive, water shrews are rarely seen. But this year, Peter's caught four in a relatively small area, suggesting Lemsford Springs has one of the highest densities in the country. It's easy to fall in love with them. I like it really because it's quite feisty. This could be the sort of jaguar of, of the small mammal world, really. What an animal. It's what a, a animal. super little animal. Do you know, I was once lucky enough to catch three of those in one morning in Longworth traps like that. 1981, Christmas Day. Was that before or after you unwrapped your presents? No, long before. I got really? Up and I, yeah, I snuck down to the river. Let them out. But I was a bit mean. I, I, I took them to the middle of a bridge and I dropped them into the river, freezing cold, to watch Aww. them swim. I know. Second best Christmas present ever. What was the first then? First was uh, 1976, Christmas Day. First otter in the wild. Oh, how, how old that? were you? 76, <laughs> I would have been 15. Oh, that's a very sweet thing to do on Christmas Day, isn't yeah. it? Now, Chris was very excited about that, and in fact, he's been very excited about one particular nest that we've been following here at Minsmere, and it is the nest of the bearded tits. Now, there were two adults, and we were enjoying watching them attentively feed their six chicks. But over the weekend, things took a turn for the worst. This is that gorgeous adult bearded tit, and here are the chicks. He comes in to feed them, and you can see that extraordinary gape with the spots inside. Look at that. We were getting fabulous views of these chicks, and all was going well. Then, Saturday morning, 5 a.m., it was complete devastation in the nest. All the chicks were dead, and they had, in fact, been torn apart. The female comes back and views the absolute carnage. And it's a complete mystery as to what happened, isn't it, Chris? Well, it was then. I mean, this is a great shame, because we were hoping to unpack mm. some really interesting new science about these birds this week. And, of course, they're brilliant-looking birds, one of everyone's favourites. But, you know, life goes on. The next stage was to find out what actually done this. And what we did was we looked at the evidence there. Those chicks had been partially dismembered, clue number one. But then we wanted to see if anything came back. Nothing's going to waste a meal like that. So we set up a camera. And this is what we saw the following evening. Nothing during the day, but then just before it got dark, a common shrew turned up and started to nibble at the chicks. But could this have been the culprit? Later on that night, this animal appeared. Now, we've looked at this, and we've asked Pete Oakenfell to look at it too, and it could be a water shrew. It's difficult to say in black and white there. It looks a bit larger, looks like it's white underneath and black on back. But again, would a water shrew, we've just seen that they're ferocious little predators, but would they go into a bearded tit's nest? 
and then kill all the young and dismember them? I don't think so. Later on, this animal turned up in the nest. This is a brown rat. It comes into the nest, has a look round, bit of a sniff, and then it has a feast. Now, it's far more typical of this particular species to raid birds' nests of their eggs or young. It's not been recorded in water shrews, certainly not in common shrews. They could have been opportunist. I think that we're probably looking at the animal that killed those young there. I mean, the other thought was weasel. But typically, if weasels kill things, they don't dismember them. They kill them very neatly with a bite to the back of the head, and then they will take them off and cache them, just like we've seen our stoat mm -hmm. doing. They're related, obviously, here. So I think that the most likely candidate for killing the chicks was a, was a brown rat. It's a real tragedy, isn't it? And it really surprised everyone. And in fact, we've debated, been debating it all yeah. day as yeah. to you know what animal actually did do the dirty job. Interesting to see the shrews uh, scavenging there, though. Yeah. And we know that they would do that. We had shrews in winter watch right up on the top of the mountain on that carcass. The common shrews right at the top of the mountain are in the middle of winter feeding on a red deer carcass. So it's their sort of behaviour, but I don't think they were responsible for the actual killing of the chicks. And again, we only get to see these things because we have those cameras giving us privileged views of those nests, but it's a shame. Anyway, let's join Yolo. Now, he's on his Scottish odyssey. Uh, last time we saw him, he was in Shetland. Well, now he's on what is probably one of the most far-flung islands in the UK, and he's gone there to look for a very specific animal family. With an undisturbed coastline, rich with pristine habitat, Shetland is a haven for my favourite mammal. Shetland is famous for its otters. There are thought to be between 700 and 900 individuals here, making it the highest density in the whole of Europe. And of course, it's the best place in the world to come and see them. Welcome back to the far north of the British Isles, up here in Shetland, where, as I mentioned earlier, we've been keeping a lookout for otters. In 2006, many Springwatch fans will remember Simon King in Shetland, following the lives of two otters, Ebb and Flo. Flo is the female in the foreground there, and she has two well-grown cubs. Now, Ebb is a younger female, but she's Flo's half-sister, and she has an 11-month-old cub, the man who first introduced Springwatch to Ebb and Flo knows the otters here better than anyone. My name's John Campbell, and I watch otters. It's been a joy, to actually, to, to, to follow the families over the last nine years, ten years. Ebb had a cub on the programme, and the otter I'm hoping to show Lolo is that cub's daughter. So it's Ebb's granddaughter. This otter has a territory in the bay right in front of John's house and has a cub that's only 16 weeks old. She's so young, the cub is still honing her hunting skills and depends on a mum to feed her. But John's concerned. He hasn't seen the cub for the past 10 days. So he set up a camera trap in a spot where he often sees her mum. So far, he's had no luck. So I went to visit him to see if we could locate our mum and try and solve the mystery of her missing cub. John quickly finds signs of otter activity. Some fresh poo. There's a lot of sprint on here, John, isn't there? Yes. They do this all around the territories. It's a vital form of communication to let other otters know who's feeding in the area. They say it smells like jasmine tea, don't they? Yeah. Tell you what, if that's jasmine tea, you can keep it, John. I think I'll just stick with yeah. my builder's tea, yeah? <laughs> well, that's good. That's good for us. Excellent. We are definitely on the right track, but it seems our mum is not the only otter frequenting this bay. Oh, wow, John, look at this. Yeah, it's a, fa a favourite spot for otters to jump up and uh, obviously bring crabs up and uh, eat them. It's crab Armageddon, isn't it? It really is. It's not long before we spot an otter. But it's not our mum. So which one's this then, John? This, this one we're watching now is, is the, uh, the, the dominant male. 
Though males and females live apart, this dog otter's home range overlaps with our mum's, and so he could be the father of her cub. We walk further around the bay and soon spot another otter. This young male has just moved into the area and he's desperately trying to keep out of the way. Because uh, if he gets caught by a male dog otter, he'll be asked to leave it unpolitely. It's a bit worrying. An unrelated dog otter in the area could be a threat to our cub, as aggressive males have been known to attack and even kill vulnerable young otters. She's not going to be happy with that. No, no, she's, this, is, this is her patch and she mm. wants to keep it that way. It's always great to see otters in the wild, but my quest is to find our family. So we keep looking. John. Just, right. just, just around the rock. See? Oh yeah. Just yeah. around the rock over there. It's on the on the right hand end. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think it's the female. You can tell you can tell her because of this blonde mane that she has. Finally, we get a glimpse of what we've been searching for. Ebb's granddaughter. That's, That's great. That's okay. Well spotted, Laura. Well Bob's spotted. Again. I'm so pleased we've seen her, John. I really, really am. She's got a crab in her mouth. This she's coming towards us with a crab. Yep. But it's not everything we'd hoped for. Her cub is nowhere to be seen. So she's here now feeding up. Where's the cub then, John? Well, the cub's probably hidden away somewhere. It's a huge investment for a female otter and a family. That's why they're so protective of them. After I left, John checked his camera trap that he carefully placed in our mum's territory. And was thrilled that our cub was very much alive. It's such a relief to see that the cub is thriving. With a mum's devoted care, I very much hope that the Spring Watch Otter dynasty will continue for years to come. Isn't that a lovely story? Ebb and flow, their legacy lives on. It certainly does. It does. Can I tell you a little anecdote? Go okay. on, have then, got Martin. Time for an anecdote? Go on. I have worked with John Campbell, mm -hmm. and this is how well he knows his otters. Alan Titchmarsh wanted to go up and film otters up there, and they said, Can, Alan, John, can you provide us with otters for the one hour that we've got Alan Titchmarsh? One hour. And John said, Yeah, I think we can. So Alan Titchmarsh turns up, and John says, Stand by that island there. He stands by the island, and they say, and suddenly, three otters pop up onto no. the island. They film Alan Titchmarsh with the otters <laughs> behind. Otters disappear. Alan Titchmarsh gets back in his jet plane or whatever it was, <laughs> clears off. That is how good John Campbell is. And that's Maybe. how busy Alan Titchmarsh is. <laughs> Can I tell you, Martin, I was actually just over, over that side um, by the island mere, and I was in the hide on Sunday, and there was an otter in the water. But mm. I tell you, you couldn't have got footage, because it was up, then it was down. It was like a little jack-in-a-box, up, down. Yeah. But do you know, the squeals of delight mm. From the members of the public. You know, it's a real joy when people are celebrating wildlife like that, it isn't is. it? It's one thing to film it, but when you see it for real, mm, it's it just electrifying, it really is. Talking about electrifying, shall we go down <laughs> to the scrape? Let's go down live to the scrape. Let's see what's going on down there. Look at that, Avocet, there we go. Avocet looking a little bit sleepy. Maybe we should remind people of that what the scrape actually is. Oh yes, let's remind what they is. Thank you, Michaela. I was meant to do that, wasn't I? <laughs> Here it is, come off the sea. The scrape, all the islands are kept clear of vegetation in order for the ground nesting birds to actually nest there. Sorry about that, I got muddled up. I think that we have had a bit of bad news at the start of the programme with our bearded tits and our barn owls. So mm. let's give you some really good news. And it is about the avocets because they've been doing really well this year. There are 50 pairs of them at Minsmere this year, that's up from last year. And there's already been 40 of these gorgeous little avocet chicks that have hatched. And there's still some more eggs that hopefully will hatch. And if they all end up fledging, that will be the highest number at Minsmere for 20 years. So that's really good news. But of course, they're not entirely safe yet. 
and their parents are working hard, chasing off all sorts of intruders like shelled up mallard barnacle geese. But at least this year they don't have to chase off the badgers because, worked. you know, last year we had that complete carnage of all the chicks by the badgers and only two avocet chicks fledged last year. But now we've got the fence around the scrape and it's a much better happy ending. Heading for almost a record-breaking year. Yes, it'd be fantastic. Marvellous. Now, down on the scrape, we've noticed something rather curious going on with the black-headed gulls. Now, what is this black-headed gull doing? Do you see? It's actually grabbing small insects, flies, out of the air. We tried to find out what was going on, and we came up with the answer, we haven't got a clue. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> no, helpful. No, no, we have. We have got a clue, actually. It's very, very interesting, because actually not all insects are equal. If you look at their calorific values, they vary hugely. Now, for instance, we've got 100 kilocalories um, per 100 grams is a grasshopper, 100, but then some ants are 1,200 kilocalories per 100 grams. So in a way, that bird, that black-headed girl, might be being very clever and just picking off the really high-calorie insects. So maybe not that much. On the other hand, it just could be really irritated with them. But it looks like an awful lot of hard work, doesn't it? It does. I mean, they, surely they must have to take an awful lot of them before they actually get a well, half-decent meal. Something like a mayfly, that's, that's quite a big substantial... But those weren't mayflies, I think. But mm. I think it was being clever, getting a good meal. Well, we're not just filming the fortunes of animals here at the reserve. For the last four months, we've been filming a very special nest in Cheshire. It's early February and nesting time for one tawny owl female. She's chosen an unusual spot in some trees on a small island surrounded by the River Weaver in Cheshire. The copse is in a garden and the nest site itself is not as natural as it seems. It's a hollow tree stump that has been lovingly carved out by her landlord, Dave Cully. It's fantastic to watch, especially with something that you've designed, hoping to attract a beard to it, and within 48 hours, they're on it and they're inside, it's a fantastic feeling. Our Tawny is keen to lay her eggs, but not before she does a bit of home improvement. She'll do a lot of scraping with the claws to hollow the floor out itself, and then she'll shape all the sides and the roof. And some of it's quite hard work, but she wants it real comfortable in there. She's gonna be stuck in there for seven weeks so she'll shape it to mould her and fit her like a glove. For Dave, creating the nest wasn't just a labour of love for the Tawnies. A near-fatal car crash in the 1980s has left him in almost constant pain, and watching the birds around his house gives him welcome release. But simply observing wasn't enough for Dave. 12 years ago, he started to film them too. I got addicted to it. One camera led to four cameras. That then turned to 16 cameras. But at the moment now, I've got 20 cameras now all around the cops and on the island, so I can monitor all the birds that thrive here. He's so passionate about capturing their lives that he's even built a two-storey hide. His challenge for the next few months is to uncover the secret lives of this tawny and her mate. But it won't be easy. A lot of it's at night time, so you're sleeping a lot in the day. And just grab four hours and, and you're fine. But you've got to do that to get inside their private lives. 
As February rolls on, Dave patiently waits for the tawny female to show signs of laying eggs. Finally, on the 23rd, and to his huge relief, the first egg appears. Ten days later, and the female has laid four eggs. Sadly, in previous years, we've only ever had two surviving. So, hopefully, we will have all four hatching. And fingers crossed, I hope they all survive. But because these eggs were laid 10 days apart, the tawnies will face an uphill battle to ensure that all of the chicks hatch and live long enough to fledge the nest. Some fabulous pictures of that bird egg laying. What a treat that is. What a great naturalist Dave Cully is. And he's given up, I have to tell you, all of his spring. Every night this spring, <laughs> yes. he was up all night. He hardly slept. He struggled throughout the day. And he's put together a remarkable diary of this pair of tawny owls breeding behaviour this year. So do catch up with the next instalment tomorrow night. It's brilliant, brilliant stuff. Now, the last two weeks, the nation has been gripped by the tail of two sticklebacks, and our resplendent male stars have been spineless Sai and frisky Phil, and we've been watching them go through the ups and downs and the challenges of rearing and brooding their young. And with sticklebacks, it's the males that do that. Let's see where the nest is. It's just over here. I mean, it's a very unassuming looking nest, but it's down there with our live cameras on it. And we left them on Thursday rather worried that that rather shallow water might dry out if it was very hot over the weekend. Well, fortunately, the heavens opened, and as you can see, there's plenty of water there. So all was good. Or was it? Well, let me tell you, it's not been the best weekend for Frisky Phil. Here he is with his rather splendid-looking nest, and he's fanning his eggs. He's been a good dad throughout. But then this happens, an otter comes. Now this is about the third or fourth time an otter has trashed his nest, but this time he made a very good job of trashing it. And he trashed it completely. You can see all the silt there. There's absolutely nothing left apart from these little fry. So the eggs had hatched and you've got these tiny little sticklebacks. Unfortunately though, they weren't developed enough to survive. They couldn't swim off, so we presume they all died. And then they provided a meal for lots of female sticklebacks that made the most of this free protein. And they cannibals. seemed- Cannibals. They really were, female cannibals. They came from all over the place. Phil came back, but I must say, once he took a look at the devastation, he decided that it was oh, game he, over. He's a sorry looking individual. He's lost all his color. He has. He looks haggard. And now he's lost his nest, absolutely haggard. And then after that, after the female sticklebacks came and ate some of the eggs, these water beetles decided to have a go as well. Look at that. And we haven't seen him since, have we? Do you know what the moral of the story is? It's not always the good looking, sexy ones that are the winners. Bridget Bardo, <laughs> Raquel Welsh, that's not, that's not Megan real Fox. Real life, though, I mean, is they it? They seem to be doing all right, that's don't they? Movie really? life. Look, enough of Frisky Phil. Frisky Phil, he's, he's had it. He's over. He, it's, it's all over for Frisky. <laughs> what about Sai? What happened to Sai over the weekend? If you remember, we left him, the water was heating up. He was going to need to fan furiously to keep that nest oxygenated. Remember, he's got lots of eggs in there. They need that oxygen in order to develop. Well, everything was going well, but then, a duck dabbled past, sending a curtain of silt overneath, over the uh, uh, nest. The leech is then swimming past. Now, a leech is a predator of that, so he has to drive that leech away. All of, th all of these things are potential threats to the stickleback. The caddisfly larva, even this, look, look at this. He can't even tolerate those. He's got to get rid of that. What a dutiful little stickleback that is. And then he's fanning away again. 
doing a brilliant, brilliant job. And this, of course, is about cleaning out the waste products and supplying that nest with oxygen. And here, look, he's adding extra holes. This is air conditioning for the nest. So he's making these holes so that he can fan more water through. Now, we don't know what's going on inside that nest. The temperature's been quite high, so it could be that there are already little fry in mm. there. They won't come out yet until they've used all of their egg sac, but their future to survival will depend on his fanning rate. And we've been looking at how frequently Sai has been fanning. And you see, as the temperature goes up, that means that the water has less oxygen in it. So we predicted that he would have to fan more frequently, and indeed he did, up to a point, although not as much as we thought he might. And when we researched it, it turned out that, in fact, it's the sighting of the nest which is more important than the water temperature, the degree of fanning and everything else. So it appears that Sai has got himself a top spot, a des res, in that particular little patch of silk. That's just luck, surely. Let's go live to Sai. <laughs> live to Sai, we love it, don't we? There what? he is! And he's fanning. And we're fanning the fan. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> what a beauty. He's Didn't... lost some of his colour though, hasn't he? And that's because, you know, this is a fish that isn't sleeping. It's a fish that isn't eating. It's a fish that's just fanning. <laughs> That's all he's got to do at the moment, and keep those predators away. And what we're hoping, of course, is that by the end of the week, there'll be some sigh fry coming out of that Sigh <laughs> fry, I some love it. Sigh fry. But Chris, I've got to say, you know, there are lots of threats to sigh. We've seen it with Frisky Phil, you know, his nest is over, mm. his life is over. So I'm just keeping my fingers crossed that he actually gets through to Thursday when we finish. You know, it'll be a real sigh of relief if he does. He certainly will. <laughs> but you know, he's inspired so many people. I was down here at the weekend and there were loads of kids taking selfies of selfies them with, with, with sigh, sigh in honestly. the background. And apparently he's got about two and a half, over two and a half thousand followers on Twitter. There we are. How about that? What I a love success. that. Champion and underdog. The life of this little stickleback just down here, a humble little fish, is just as interesting as some fabulous species some exotic, glamorous thing on the plains of the Serengeti or in Antarctica. <laughs> I know, little Sai could inspire future cameramen because a lot of our Springwatch cameramen have been inspired by things that are on their local patch and we've shown you a few of them over the last couple of weeks. Well, tonight, cameraman Ian Llewellyn takes us to his local patch that inspired him and it's a river in a very urban part of Bristol. Now, his film is, is quite edgy, very arty. It does have flash images so be warned uh, but it's beautiful in a real stark way but um it has a bit of a quirky start so don't adjust your tv set when the sun's coming up in the morning i start my walk and i try and head down there for first light i've kind of spent as much as my spare time on the river as i possibly can and as I've developed my career as a cameraman, I've kind of shifted down the river, moving towards the bridge at the end, which is now my patch where I spend most of my time. It's a concrete and steel monster, completely entombed by lanes of motorway. The river itself flows directly under the motorway. They mirror each other, and they create these very abstract shapes and lines. Pretty much all the time when I film, I'm looking in a black and white viewfinder. The cameras that we use for TV, they are colour, but the viewfinder is black and white. I'm used to seeing things in black and white. Also, a lot of my photography is done in black and white. I see light in a certain way, and I see shapes and shadows. This is how I see the world. I don't just photograph wildlife. I'm interested in the landscape itself. I find it beautiful. I find the lines on the water beautiful. The patterns that you get from these shapes that we've made against the soft lines of nature, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. I love that. when the first sun comes up and it finally makes it over the edge of the motorway and it casts beams down into the river. That's when the river really opens up and you can see what's in there. 
and it is now completely made up of shopping trolleys, uh, bicycles, mopeds, cars, whatever's down there is illuminated by the sun. It's a good time to spot eels because you get eels under the motorway, which probably people would never imagine you'd even see an eel down there. The thing is, I'm interested in wildlife. I just go out to photograph things that I find interesting. There was a, a moth, and as he vibrated, he created this pattern. But it's exactly him, almost death print of himself, rippling out in the still water, while little minnows are pulling on his legs, trying to pull him down. I could have only ever got that picture if he was in that split of motorway light. It would never work. You could never recreate that anywhere. There are times when I go down the bridge and I see a kingfisher under there, but more often than not, I hear them whiz through the concrete and the steel and it penetrates. It's like that high-pitched whistle which belts down the river. I don't really go out to, to see the otter itself. I go out to find signs that it's been through the motorway. The world finds a balance when I find an otter print because I think there's cars whizzing back and forth and there's otters down there at night. I'm possibly the only person in the whole of Bristol who goes for a subway to look at a spider. <laughs> I look at the lights, which are always sort of splattered in spider webs. They must have been there for generations. The same dynasties of spiders breeding and constantly living on these light sources. From the subways, I go to a Victorian boating lake, and that's where I photograph the black-headed gulls. I find them beautiful to watch and they're perfect for my type of photography. I streak them, I abstract them. I try and get my pictures to resemble their antics, do you know what I mean? They are constantly barrelling in flight, very agile. You know, they're beautiful to watch and against the dark water, because of the contrast of the sun, I'm able to get interesting shapes and patterns. I don't really like being away from it. I love going away to film wildlife. Obviously, if I get a shoot to go and film lions, yeah, that's fantastic. But wherever I am in the world, for some reason, I always think of my patch. I don't know, it's very personal to me, that river, do you know what I mean? And it's, it's shaped where I've gone in life. Without that river, I would never be a wildlife cameraman. So I owe that river a lot. Now they say, don't they, that beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And of course, this rural scene here with its flowers, its trees and its scudding clouds is one thing. But I rather like those little gems of wildlife in that tangled concrete of the city. For me, that was a very striking film. Joe Charlesworth was also one of the cameramen. I think it was a brilliant job. It was fantastic. I thought you'd like that one. Oh, I did like it <laughs> very, very, very arty. much. Very, very much. Great <laughs> photos, too. Yeah. Great photos, too. Now, another species that we've been looking at here is a heathland specialist, and it's the first time we've had a nest on this bird. It lives out on the dry heath over here behind us. It's got heather, it's got gorse. The gorse is very important to this species because it's there that it finds most of its uh, invertebrate food. I'm talking about the Dartford warbler. Here's a male singing, but we've been watching a little nest of these birds. Look at that. The females come in to feed them, and today at 7.30 this morning, they decided to fledge, and they started one by one to hop out into the surrounding vegetation. And this is very typical of this species. The nest is quite low down, so it's, it's in a tangle. They're not leaping into thin air and hoping to land on a branch. The female comes back, they've gone, and then she does something a little bit quirky. She sits down and starts to brood. The male comes in as if to ask her, what on earth are you <laughs> thinking about? And at that time, the youngsters have heard the birds and they've come back to the nest. And again, this is typical of this species. They're hopping around in this low cover, so they'll disappear, come back to the nest, or come back to wherever the adults are, are coming to. And we've seen this in various species over the years. Water rails, they left the nest and all came back. 
it's, in some species we call it branching. They go out into the branches of the trees and then they come back to the nest. But Michaela, you came up with another name, semi-fledging, which could call semi-fledging, yeah, I'm telling you. on, didn't it? Yeah. Caught on big time. But that's what they're doing. Semi-fledging. And seen now completely fledging. When it appears in a British Trust for Ornithology, uh, Ornithology glossary, then you can officially claim that. Well, that's a, easy a, for you to say. <laughs> I think she's gone into the scientific pantheon, mate, with that semi-fledging. I have, I'm telling you. It's very, very good. Well, that was a Dartford warbler. Now, it may be the third week of spring watch this year, but we've still got new nests. And this one is, I'm glad to say, one of our spring watch SOS birds, the greenfinch. A gorgeous bird, you may have seen it in your garden, green, but with that lovely yellow flash on the wing. And it's nesting here near our production village in some brambles. And it's got three chicks here. Very interesting, the Dartford warbler and many of the other birds we've seen, they feed their chicks high energy insect food, I think but not these. They're feeding it sort of, oh, there's not three, there's I five chicks, five aren't they? That's not very good, the counting's not very good. But look at this feeding. She's feeding a sort of a soup of seeds, like a sort of gruel or porridge. She chews them up and turns them into this sort of paste, which she's feeding all the chicks. And occasionally they do get a bit of insect food in there as well, but they're nearly ready to go. They're already fluttering their wings, exercising those flight muscles, and they will go fairly soon. Well, shall we have a look at them live? Maybe shall they've we? gone yeah, already. Let's have a look I hope not. There they are. As Martin was saying, they are ready to go, and so they could go any time now. So keep your eye on them, especially online and on the red button, because you might see them fledge before we do tomorrow on our show. But it's um, be lovely to see them go. Striking bird, the greenfinch, but it also has a very striking call. Listen to this. You might have heard it in your garden. A little warble, and then that long, drawn-out note. And they normally call from the top of a bush or a tree, typically a piece of lay land eye down in the bottom of your neighbour's garden, perhaps that's where you'll see them. And do you know, tonight on Unsprung, we've got an acoustic theme. We've got filmmaker and musician Simon with us, uh, Willis with us, and he is going to transpose the call of the bittern into musical notation and play it on a piano. Well, you've got to see that, surely. That's going to be something quite remarkable. Does he need my help? I could do my... Woo! Woo! I don't want to hear that on a piano or on no, any other new musical good, instrument, to be quite honest with you. Do you know, I've got to be honest about something. Tonight, I have underdressed. I've got to tell you, I did not realise how cold it was going to get and I have been really chilly. But what is going on with the weather this spring? We started off the series three weeks ago and it was pretty chilly and windy bit milder last week. You know, this week it's been sunny all day. But Weekend the, was fab fabulous. Yeah, fabulous, yeah. but the temperatures have really dropped tonight. It's certainly affecting me, but how on earth is this week going to affect our wildlife? I reckon there's only one man that can tell us, and it's Nick Miller. Oh, Michaela, flaming June, we're having a laugh. It's about 11 degrees where you are right now. It's not going to be much warmer over the next couple of days. Yes, there's high pressure in charge of our weather. It's mainly dry, settled. Some spots are warming up. Northeast Scotland, for example. But around the high pressure, you've got a wind coming in from the North Sea. And that's a chilly direction. So temperatures will be struggling the next few days. Let's hope the blue tit chicks, a Dartford warbler, newly fledged, can find the food they need to survive. Maybe Maybe the green finches will semi-fledge a flutter outside and right back into the next when they nest when they realize just how chilly it is. And nights are chilly too. Now too much wind at Minsmere for a frost, but elsewhere we saw a touch of grass frost in Northern Ireland this morning. There may be that touch of frost on the ground. Uh, some of us will notice that in the next few mornings if you're up and about early enough. But the bite in your weather at Minsmere is coming from that northeasterly wind. From a North Sea, if you dip your toe in it, it's about 10 Celsius right now. The air is being cooled to the sea temperature. So high to the next couple of days, uh, not much above that. No sign of summer, let alone spring in this forecast. And you've got the wind. We know the barn owls do not like to hunt in the wind. So they, let's hope they find the food to feed the chicks. Trying to find a positive. Maybe that wind will stir the water around spineless Sam Simon, do some of the fanning for him. But to put the flame into June for the humans, build a log fire. You might need it. Right. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nick. Nice to see Nick there in his polo shirt whilst we're all out here with our puffer jackets. Thank you very much, Nick. Yeah, but zero degrees. Know, Can you believe shocking. that? I can't that's believe absolutely it. appalling. <laughs> now, we did say earlier dramatic things were happening with our red shank. Now, at about three o'clock this afternoon, we saw something truly astonishing. 
Here's the red shank nest. As you see, those eggs are just pipping. They're starting to hatch, and look at this. She's agitated. Look at that. An adder is actually going over the eggs. Well, that's amazing. It's gone over, over them. the eggs. Now, those eggs hatched out. Well, they were starting to hatch, but they were out two hours later. If they'd been out, mm. it would have been the end, wouldn't it? That well, adder would have been a lot. Yeah. Let's have a look at them live now. And because the chicks are out now, but uh, she seems to still be brooding them. I guess it is cold, though, isn't it? It's not yeah, the so best night for them warm. to hatch. Whatever happens, even if they've hatched now, she'll brood them overnight. There's no doubt about that. And then they'll leave in the morning when it warms up. She won't take them out now. Should we have a look at them mm. of when they did come out? You can see she's restless. She's moving around a bit. Those eggs are underneath and they've started to pit. That means that the, the shell has started to crack. They've started to start saying, knock, knock, I'm coming out. You can just see the beak there, Michaela, can't you, of the chick? Oh, yes, you, you can. can. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Egg, egg two. And that's it. She's clearing the eggs away. And there you get a little peak of the first chick. There it is, still wet, having emerged from that egg. She's carried the shell away, of course, so it doesn't attract predators. And that was 5 o'clock this afternoon. Well, let's hope afternoon. that they keep warm enough, because it is cold. But listen, I've got something for you both. Right. It's a poem. The red shank was brooding in lovely light, and Ada slithered by and gave it a fright. But the egg stayed untouched, safely out of sight, then hatched. Hurrah! It's the remedy of spring tonight. Oh, I see. I got the good. word in! Not <laughs> bad. <laughs> spring word included. Uh, well, yeah, I'll take my hat off to you. I'll take my the hat off to you. Yeah. Average, but Before we go, this afternoon we saw something really exciting. We've been watching a, a stoat, we watched a female and a male out here just close to the studio. And this afternoon when the sun was up, we saw this. This is the female stoat and it's caught itself a rabbit. Look at the size of it. I know. Look, it has to stop and rest and it's carting off. We know this animal's got kits. We saw it moving them from this area in the open into the patch of gorse. 65% of their diet is rabbit, and 65% of their kit's dinner is going to be rabbit tonight, at least, I would say. <laughs> because that's a, a full-grown rabbit that that animal's carrying. What about that? What a sight. That I, should have, I should have written a poem about that instead, really, shouldn't I? Yeah, you could have done. You could I think have it's done. amazing to see a stoat. I've, I've probably only seen ten times in my life a, a wild stoat. And yet, out here, they're all over the place. Yeah. yeah, well, I saw them last week, didn't I? Rolling the egg down the hill. Yeah, so it's amazing that it you've seen so much of them. Stoke tastic. Oh, mate. we like yeah. that. We like that. Stoke tastic. <laughs> That's just about all we've got time for. Do stay with us, though, for Unsprung, which is on the red button and online. We've got Simon Scott with us. He's a sonic artist and he's composing a piece about Minsmere using all of the sounds which he's recording here. I've got to tell you, it's absolutely amazing. Well worth listening to. And we've also got a mystery object. We're going to reveal Ooh. the answer as to what this is in Unsprung. What do you think? Look at that. Look at the pattern on the top of it here. Mm -hmm. And equally at both ends here. It's a back scratcher, without a doubt. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's something that you use for Dracula or something like that. Anyway, what have we got coming up for you tomorrow? Let's have a look. Well, we'll be keeping in contact with our barn owls, of course. How do they turn their heads like that? Yolo heads to a seabird skyscraper in the furthest most corner of the UK to see one of my favourite birds, puffins. And the biggest question on Spring Watch this year, will spineless Psy have fry? <laughs> <laughs> now don't forget to come back for all the very latest news with Brett Westwood tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock. Meanwhile, it's goodbye for us. Bye-bye. Good night.